When Ryan's when it's time to begin, it's on the rewind to rhyme with John Pollock and waiting the A team. That makes sense that these things we see in the ring every week on TV. It's rewind to rhyme for Monday night, download a Tuesday morning from the post wrestling site. It's rewind to rhyme for Monday night on USA now on the John and Wei take the mic. Hello, it's John Pollock and Wei Ting. We're finally here. It's Monday. Bellator 256 week. How are you, Way? Oh, yeah, I can't wait. 262. It's a very special number. 56. Built up. 256, yeah, I mean, sorry. How are you? How are you tonight? Doing all right. Yeah, not bad. Just um, diving right in, man. Let's just get to it. Yeah, we're, there's no small talk all week long. It's just right to the, the meat of the bone, uh, so to speak. Uh, we're going to be uh, previewing all that is uh, coming up this week. There's a lot to uh, discuss and preview, uh, but I do want to uh, just take a minute to thank those that were involved on Saturday with post-podcast day. Uh, I thought it went really well on Saturday. Uh, we had six really great shows, uh, and I want to thank uh, all of the listeners, all of the Host who joined us for six plus hours. And if you are a patron at any level, the entire video is up on the cafe uh, for you to watch. And uh, we will be slowly rolling out uh, s- most of the shows that were there on Saturday onto various podcast feeds. The, uh, the Nubian Wrestling Advocates, they've put out their show on the Kings of Sport feed. Uh, up next like, has released. On the Kings of Sport Patreon. Correct. And up next has put out the worst WrestleMania matches ever. And then this week, uh, the BWE will put out their award-winning interview with Gary Michael Capetta. Yeah, everybody came in like really strong with with just uh, like an hour of excellent material. And to just get it all in succession with everybody tuning in into the Zoom at once was just so much fun. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, The T-shirt commemorating the event is on sale for this week only at store.postwrestling.com so if you enjoyed the whole thing go grab one of those but now it's time to look ahead and i'm not going to go through everything that we've got coming up because we'll have plenty of shows this week to promote things uh that are are coming ahead but the the major things uh this week we will have back-to-back nights of nxt takeover post shows on wednesday and thursday night with Braden harrington and davy portman uh they will also be doing these shows live at twitch.tv slash up next podcast they're doing a plethora of shows this week uh so you can check all that out including the two takeover post shows they're doing watch alongs for almost everything that's going on this week including i think raw and smackdown and wrestlemania so uh bookmark their twitch and just uh watch with those guys for everything uh we'll have all of our regular shows with uh, dynamite on wednesday night with way and i live friday night will be live for all patrons with rewind to smackdown and then saturday and sunday night wrestlemania post shows so the first night night one we will be doing our regular pay-per-view format where we're live for our double double ice cap and espresso patrons sunday night we will be live immediately after wrestlemania for all patrons and taking calls on both of those shows. Uh, also, there will be several bonus shows uh, coming out for cafe members. So uh, keep refreshing your feed uh, because starting Wednesday, we'll be doing uh, some daily uh, bonus shows uh, to keep everyone up to date on everything that's happening. It's a massive week. The whole schedule is up at postwrestling.com. Uh, WrestleMania, secondary only to uh, the main event of WH Park and Nate Milton coming together for MCU later uh, as they review episode four. I'm, that's that's the pairing I'm looking forward to the most this weekend. Are you kidding me? Yeah, I can't wait to hear their thoughts on uh, l- the latest episode of Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Only three left. Man, and what Loki is coming out June 11th? Is that the the release yeah. date? Mm-hmm. So you're you're gonna have a bit of a gap. Yeah, thankfully. Yeah, that's nice. You shouldn't go right into the next one. I think you need a little breather bet- before Loki comes in. Breaks are good. Yeah. Yes. Well, we are going to have no breaks this week. This was the first of nine consecutive nights of WWE programming. And we can go into some of the news that we have to talk about uh, coming up this week. But wait, is there anything else you want to uh, point out for this week? No, not a whole lot. Plenty of chance to, to keep up with it. So uh, join us, everybody, for everything. So it's going to... The WWE's portion starts on Tuesday night. And so... <laughs> 
I was under the impression that this was going to be like, they're just going to cram all of these inductions into one show. Well, what they are doing on Tuesday night way is two 90 minute hall of fame special. So we're going to get 90 minutes from eight till nine 30 for the 2020 class, which will feature the bulldog NWO Bella twins, Jushin Liger, JBL, William Shatner and Titus O'Neil. And then at nine 30, another 90 minute special is listed uh, with that being the 2021 class with Eric Bischoff, Kane, Molly, Great Khali, Rob Van Dam, and Ozzy Osbourne. So nothing to start off your week than three hours of Hall of Fame uh, coverage on Tuesday night. It, it actually sounds more manageable than I think I was thinking in my head. You know, in the past, some of these specials have been three hours just with one class. So the fact that they're, they're keeping both classes to an hour and a half, it just no, seems no like one they're... No one to induct people either, so you're eliminating mm-hmm. all of those speeches. But, I mean, of these, I mean, we have 10 people. Um, it sounds like Ozzy Osbourne just, like, sent in a video. Obviously, Liger is not going to be there live. Shatner, you would think, would be pretty short and probably in the same style. So, like, some of these are... I, I'm not expecting the great Kali to go up there for... 20 minutes. And we know the fact that, you know, the, at least for the Bella twins, we're told three to five. So it seems like your main eventers, whoever those are, will get the lengthier time, but 90 minutes commercial free, like you're going to fit the, those all in. I get, I guess my question would be, um, where, where is like, are you going to watch this on Tuesday night? Like, this is not something you have to cover, but are you going to watch at least some of it or all of it? I'm not going to make an effort like to sit down in front of my TV on Tuesday to to catch it all, but I'll probably catch it the next day, you know, especially if there are any relevant speeches. Um, it's, it, it doesn't seem like something that what, what I am concerned about is maybe some of the grandeur and some of the maybe sentimentality of some of the speeches are probably going to be lost when you're trying to condense something, somebody's career into three to five minute speech. Uh, so in that sense, I think it'll feel maybe a lot more kind of cold, unfortunately. Um, but I'm, Obviously very curious to see, you know, if anything interesting is said, but I think the chances of like any sort of renegade, like crazy special moments that might not necessarily be there since these are taped shows. If we're not having uh, inductors, I really guess they, they've missed their opportunity to have Riddle induct Rob Van Dam. I guess so. Yeah, that was always something like fun, you know, to think about who, what the pairings would be of who would induct whom. But um, this year we're not getting that. Uh, So then we have uh, Wednesday and Thursday night, the takeover specials. And uh, this is interesting because in Canada on on Rogers, uh, they are listing uh, the first night of takeover for both Sportsnet 360 and the WWE Network, meaning that if it's on the WWE Network that you're in Canada going to have the option to watch this like the Peacock version without commercials. Even more interesting is that Sportsnet 360 is listing the second night of TakeOver for Thursday, um, both on their website and on the guide. And I did – I have asked uh, Sportsnet for – just to confirm that they're carrying the second night live. Um, I guess there's ways you can do it. It's just to me, the Peacock version is commercial free. So I guess you could do stuff like picture in picture and find ways around it. Uh, It just seems like it would be – uh, not as easy to just uh, pick up the yeah, like the first night of having that USA Network feed that has the built-in commercial breaks for Sportsnet to carry the second night. Who knows? You know what? What I mean um, is something. Are they preempting something else that typically runs on a Thursday on Sportsnet 360 to run a takeover? Could it? Could it be a mistake that that was listed? I mean, it's. Uh, It's on the guide and on their website, it's listed as like stand and deliver night two. So I, Hmm. I mean, it doesn't appear to be a mistake. You'd maybe on one, but not the other. But again, I have asked for confirmation. If I hear different, I will uh, let people know. But I I think, you know, the fact that you can watch it on the WWE network both nights without commercials, that will be, um, that will be appealing to a lot of people that can just watch it that way, because I think that's how you'd want to watch these shows. I guess in the end, you know, if people decide to subscribe to the network instead of watching it on Sportsnet, I mean, Rogers still gains. Rogers is the distributor. It's not like WWE is doing this on their own. It's like Rogers is the distributor of the actual network in Canada. 
Um, so that first night, again, has Io Shirai, Raquel Gonzalez, Walter Tommaso Ciampa, the six-person uh, gauntlet match to set up Johnny Gargano's challenger for night two, MSK versus the Grizzled Young Vets versus Raul Mendoza and Joaquin Wild for the vacant NXT tag titles. And I think that three-way is going to be terrific. Yeah. I think there's a lot on these shows that could be uh, fantastic. And then Pete Dunn and Kushida uh, rounds out uh, night number one. What's like jumping out at you these first couple of nights way, or is it just all like a blur at this point of the insane amount of shows and matches that are scheduled? It's honestly a bit of a blur, but uh, I think both main events look very attractive. Obviously, Cole and O'Reilly. Actually, we not, we're not even mentioning it, but the, the prime target that's supposed to go up on the Tuesday, that's something mm-hmm. I'm really looking forward to that I'll definitely make time for, maybe even ahead of the takeover. But Pete Dunn, Kushida looks amazing. Uh, I'm definitely curious to see what Raquel Gonzalez could do in a main event. Walter Ciampa on that first night, like they're both pretty stacked, I think, both takeovers. And Dunn and Kushida is just like thrown in there. Like that could be incredible um, the, the first night. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's going to be the first night. And then, of course, AEW is uh, has their live show on Wednesday night as well, which is uh, featuring Moxley and the Young Bucks against Kenny Omega and the Good Brothers as the featured match, along with the TNT title match with Darby Allen and J.D. Drake. Uh, so that's kind of the the first night. We'll chat more about this uh throughout the week and all of the shows to come. There's just a insane amount of it. Uh, But we're going to go backwards to Sakura Genesis on Sunday, uh, where Will Ospreay became the IWGP World Heavyweight Champion, defeating uh, Kota Bushi. Uh, I saw most of the card. I didn't watch the entire thing, but I saw the top two matches as well as the... uh, the reveal with Aaron Hanare for the uh, the and watch the uh, the six man. But let's let's talk about the main event first of all. Uh, were you surprised that they uh, went this way, putting the championship on to Osprey? Very much so. Um, you know, I mean, Ibushi recently revealing the new championship belt. I mean, him not necessarily being champion all that long. We're really just past March here. Um, so I think you know, with the way he won the belt. The, the years-long struggle of capturing that championship, I personally didn't expect him to lose it so soon. Um, so definitely, like, surprise booking. And booking, I actually enjoy. Like, I, I like kind of unpredictable title changes, um, such as something like this gets people talking fresh. Not that even, like, here's the other thing, is that, like, Ibushi still had plenty of matches to go to, so it wasn't that, like, we needed to freshen up the main event scene at all. So that, I think, made this especially surprising. But, you know, still, uh, like, opens the door for a bunch of fresh matchups. Uh, and I I like it. I think, you know, Will Ospreay's done really good work. And a belt like this just kind of cements his status at the top. The match was, was of course, fantastic. Yeah, I thought Osprey selling the, the shoulder was uh, r- really strong, even when he did the shooting star press and they had the delay in the cover where he's he's holding the shoulder. Uh, we saw the poison Rana off the top with Osprey landing on his feet. And then... Dude, that power German where Abushi just sent Will and my God, if you watch this in slow motion, like Will's neck turn and his head turn in like a 90 degree angle coming down. It was pretty brutal. Yeah, um, he's young and I guess he could take that level of flexibility. For now. Yeah. yeah. Um, the big kick out was Osprey kicking out of the, the Kamagoye and then hit this insane flying knee from like halfway across the ring he just flew in the air abushi is all dazed hidden blade stormbreaker and osprey gets the victory and afterward it's a uh, cob attacking kota abushi with the tour of the islands and osprey is there holding the iwgp world heavyweight championship and the rev pro titles and out comes kazuchika okada and before he is able to speak, Shingo Takagi appears. So these are the next two challengers set up uh, where they're playing off of Osprey's loss to Okada at Wrestle Kingdom, but then be- uh, beating Takagi in the finals of the recent New Japan Cup a-, a few weeks ago. So the way it ended, and Okada never even said a word here, is that Osprey will defend the title against Takagi on the second night of Wrestling Dontaku on May 4th, and then Okada will face the winner on May 29th at the Tokyo Dome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, interesting choices of uh, main events. I mean, I think both very worthy main events, but man, would a Nobushi okada match have been bigger? Would an Ibushi-Shingo match have been bigger for, for those nights? 
uh, definitely makes me wonder some some of those decisions. But I think they're both worthy matchups, and you can kind of understand where they're going with the booking that led to it from previous months. Yeah, they've got they've got so many big shows lined up, and it, it feels like these shows it's going to be very heavily weighted upon this this world championship picture and trying to create enough enticing matches in a very short period of time. They've got they held this press conference and announced like 5000 shows that are coming up. They're running Core Q and Hall 5 times this month and uh, their recent Core Q and Hall shows like they're drawing under 400 people for these shows. Um then they've got two back-to-back nights in uh Kagoshima at the end of the month on the 28th and 29th. Uh the first night will feature Rapongi 3K um, did you want to chat about anything else from Sakura Genesis? Because uh, Rapongi 3K won the junior heavyweight tag titles uh, with the return of Yo uh, and his new finisher, the Direct Drive. Yes, yes, love it. Um, I thought, you know, 3K looked fantastic as usual. I think I was happy to see them, uh, see Yo come back and reunite. But I just kind of, you know, I was hoping that they'd go on their singles run sooner than later. Um, just for a bit of a fresher direction. I just feel like this is just kind of returning things back to the status quo. Uh, and maybe they will. But, you know, at some point, I just wish, like, all those guys would start to branch out. And we, we're starting to see it with Desperado here. Um, so, you know, maybe this is a, a way to lead to something. But, um, yeah, it was cool. I, I liked the match. I thought Yo Yo was the focus, and they... They went after the knee, which was the natural uh, story to tell. And I thought this was more so a showcase of of Yo. A lot of his selling. Uh, I liked the match. To me, it was um, good for the time that it that it was. And I guess they're they're. I think it's trying to branch out Yo a bit more as well. So and I think inevitable you can do the showdown between these two, like way way down the road. But uh, I thought it was a good match. Um, how about the introduction of Aaron Hanare? I liked it a lot. You know, I think a lot of people suspected he would be X. And um, I think, you know, this heel turn is a long time coming for him. It's a way to make him a lot more devastating. The, um, you know, the 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 look is, uh, it's, it's, it's a little bit different, you know, different enough. Uh, really, it's more about the attitude and really it's more about the booking, I would say. And uh, day one, I think he fits in really well with the group. Well, we'll await the, uh, the ruling on his gear. And if it gets yeah. a pass, yeah. Um, but but anyway, so um, we're not going to go over all these cards, but these are some of the the big matches happening over the the next while that they've announced. So April twenty eighth in Kagoshima, it's Rapongi three K against Desperado and Kanemaru in a rematch, a no time limit match between Toru Yano and Evil for the King of Pro Wrestling title. That's got to be a rib, right? Those like are your e- top two matches. Yes. Evil in an unlimited time limit match with Toriano. Yes, <laughs> I can't wait. Um, then the next night, um, a pretty standard fare for the second night in Kagoshima. It's Abushi and Tanahashi against Jeff Cobb and Aaron Hanare, and Osprey and the Great Okan against Naito and Shingo Takagi. Uh, we go to the Dantaku cards in Fukuoka. May third has. Uh, the main event is Hiroshi Tanahashi and Jay White for the Never Openweight Championship. So, I mean, that made sense after the New Japan Cup outcome with White defeating Tanahashi. And the match that I'm sure Wei believed could have headlined the Tokyo Dome. The Iron Finger from Hell ladder match. Taichi versus Tamatanga. Yeah, I mean, the result of that, I think, will um, we'll probably, you know... Uh, um, divide a lot of people about whether or not something like this should exist at all much less in new japan um i'm very curious to see the story play out i was a fan of the last time they did something like this and to tell you the truth it's something different from you know like so many of these matches in the main event scene that i feel like i've i've seen quite a bit so uh yeah why not uh, and then the next night has Will Ospreay against Shingo and El Desperado against Yo. Those are the top two matches on May 4th. Uh, we mentioned Okada challenging the Osprey Takagi winner, but this is what they have coming up after those those shows. It's May 15th at Yokohama Stadium, where they have not announced anything yet. Then May 29th at the Tokyo Dome. And then eight days later is Dominion at Osaka Joe Hall. Like, this is an insane stretch that they have. Um, I- I'm still looking at this May uh, lineup and it just seems 
extremely ambitious, and I just wonder how much they are going to be forced to have to burn through to to have you know suitable cards for this level of stadiums that they're running in May. Not to mention Dominion, that's a massive show in Osaka. Mm-hmm, yeah, I mean, I'm sure that's part of the concern, but you know, the fact that they've chosen to run so many stadiums at once um, tells you that they're probably in like a lot of need of people coming in to see these shows. Um, so, you know, do they have any other choice? I mean, they do have a strong main event mix when you have, you know, the combinations of Osprey, Okada, Abushi, like Tanahashi can be inserted there. I think like you have enough different pieces to to play with as well. Uh, like Naito is kind of just off to the sides at the moment as well. Uh, but it seems like it's, it's very much um, dependent upon, upon your, your main event scene and, uh, just, I guess, a question of how much you have to put out there, like these big championship matches. Like the fact that they're doing uh, Osprey against Shingo on May 4th, and then the winner faces Okada on May 29th, that would suggest that the Yokohama Stadium show is not going to have your World Heavyweight Championship defended. And I guess they better hope that never open weight championship feels like the biggest thing in the world. Because that's yeah, what well, you're probably looking at to headline like Yokohama Stadium. Like, do. Like Tanahashi and Ibushi or something. Mm -hmm. Well, when we say headline Yokohama Stadium, what is the capacity for something like that? Um, How many people are they looking to draw? I don't know what the restrictions are at right now. If it's uh, 50%. Not sure. Yeah. Well, we will find out. Um, And the final note here is uh, this is from the Stardom show on Sunday, which... uh, I've watched the the B Priestley Utami Hayashishida match and it was phenomenal. And I was actually chatting with WH tonight and he was just raving about this card. And like the last three matches sound like they were out of this world. Um, and this match uh, in particular was noteworthy for uh, the post match after. So they, they have this fantastic match together. Uh, you had uh, Hayashishita kick out of the, the Regal Plex, the Queen's Landing. It was this amazing near fall, a B driver. And then it's uh, Hayashishita stopping a second Queen's Landing and killing Priestley with a Lariat and the Hijack Bomb uh, to win the match and retain the World of Stardom Championship. So after... Priestley is laying there in the ring. She gets the mic and she's says that Hayashishida is more than just a young girl. You are very strong. And she calls in uh, Momo Watanabe, who was ringside on commentary, into the ring. And she tells both Hayashishita and Watanabe that she loves them both. She loves everyone at stardom. This is my last match. And dude, there were gasps in the crowd. Like they were shocked. As she says, see you next time. And all three of them had this big uh, farewell hug. And that was it. B Priestley is done with stardom. Like we knew about the New Japan status, but this was more of a surprise. Uh, Dave Meltzer has noted that she is not signing with AEW. And while not confirmed, I think that's going to really limit your places of where you would guess that she's going to be going. Yeah, uh, I guess the only question would be, would it be NXT UK or NXT proper? That's it, yeah. Um, and you would think, like, NXT UK w- would make sense with, like, the, the travel restrictions at the moment. But that's th- this was a, a hell of a match to leave stardom on. I would definitely recommend this match, and it sounds like the entire card was uh, an incredible one. So that was your major news coming out of the weekend. And all of this can be found at postwrestling.com. We'll move over to the go home edition of raw. And I think way, if you said what, what is going to get me enthused for WrestleMania? It was, it was 20 minutes of King Corbin, something we have not gotten in a long time. Well, you're not going to get much of it at WrestleMania. So I don't think you're going to get any of it, right? He's in the Andre and that's it. He's in the, he's in the battle Royal. That's it on Friday. So you got to get your fill. You, you, we, we got our fill. Believe me, I struggled through that main event. Um, but there was a lot to talk about from this episode. And off the top, the return of Samoa Joe back on commentary. Yeah. Happy to see and, you. And this was taped, uh, this was taped last Tuesday. So it was the day after Raw where he was missing last week. Um, but no, no word on what that reason was, but he was back here. So there you go. Drew McIntyre comes out to start the show and he compares, 
uh, this this year to last year's Mania and where they were, and his career with Bobby Lashley's. And the difference between the two of them is the sacrifice and what Drew has been willing to sacrifice. He left his home at 22 to become WWE champion. And when times got hard, he wished he could go back home. He brings up his mother being sick and going through chemotherapy, and he wanted to go home. And she said, if you come home, I'll kick your ass. And he stayed and pushed forward for his dream. He was getting choked up here, just recalling this. He said how he got fired, came back, rose to the top, and Lashley can't beat him. And this is going to end the almighty era on Saturday. This was a hell of a promo to start the show. It was. It was really good. And it kind of felt like it came out of nowhere to the point where, like, I'm hearing all this and I'm like, wait, go back. Like, rewind, please. Like, they could have told a whole story about this guy and, um, you know, his his mother battling cancer. Um, and he just kind of, we just kind of had it inserted here into this, like, 30 second little bit. And then that was it. So um, there were elements of, I think, like, potentially realistic, good storytelling in this. But we just feel like we have to cast it all aside to do the pro wrestling generic build. Um, so I, it, it was a very good promo. It just made me disappointed about what this build could have been for a WrestleMania main event. I, I'm not too disappointed with the, this build for McIntyre and Lashley. I think it's not um, – it hasn't been a home run. I'm definitely not going to go to to that length. Um, I mean, to me, it just feels like it's it's the two – the two big unstoppable forces on raw that you've had Lashley primed for this for a year against the guy that is, you know, the star of raw. I've, I, I think what like are they it's, fight, but what are they fighting for the championship? Yeah. But why does, why do the, either one of them want the championship to be the top guy? But why is that important, John? Like to be, to be the best. What I mean is, we all know you want to be a champion to be the best, but I want to know details like his mother, pro- him making a promise to his mother who's battling chemotherapy to not give up on his dream so that he could achieve something like this. What does it mean on a human level besides just owning that piece of piece of leather? You know, like these are the type of stories I, I, I think prime target will probably hit on, but we never really see on the main roster. I don't know if we would have wanted, um, a two month story um, revolving around cancer, because I do not have faith in that being done in any way tastefully. So whose fault is that? The bad storytelling or the fact that this, like this is a story that clearly exists. That's out there. Even Bobby Lashley, like the amount of like story that I think is there of him finally obtaining this championship belt. There's so much more to do than I think what we got. Does this give you any sense of, uh, the direction for for Saturday, like this, this was the kind of promo where I I cannot fathom them beating Drew on Saturday. I don't think it matters. I think everything on this episode was just them wanting to fill three hours to get to the next week, um, and whatever was said here was just probably you know stuff to fill time. Lastly, an MVP came out and he said Drew's time is over. He felt Drew shaking in the hurt lock, and MVP said that. On Saturday, he's going to lose his dignity, consciousness, and the match. And Drew comes back and says, well, I could just give up and become an Uber driver or an Amazon driver. But instead, I won't quit. And MVP warns him, you might not make it to WrestleMania. And King Corbin comes out to say, yeah, you won't make it to WrestleMania. So Nothing wrong took, with being an Uber driver. Not or at all. Like, what, 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 a, what a shameful, like, That's line. That's not giving to, up. In a poor That's economy, like, like yeah. I mean, God, if you're making ends meet and you've got a, there's nothing wrong with being an Uber driver. I, I'm not as familiar with Amazon drivers, but I mean, they're probably pretty busy over this pandemic. In fact, I know they are. Really they're, fucking, they're on my street every day. Really difficult work. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Sorry, Drew. Respect, Drew. Yeah. Yeah. This was a bit of a heel line. Oh. Then, then Raw officially began because we went to Kofi Kingston and Xavier Woods who met with Riddle. Riddle came up and said that Omos's power level is way over 9000. You got that's that a Dragon reference. Ball reference, right? Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He has never seen anyone get as high as Kofi Kingston last week. This is when he was wrestling Omos. It's like, "Oh, awesome. We've got a whole 
pot promo. And he asks if Omos can get both of them high on Saturday. He describes Sheamus as pretty diesel and stinky. Ali is a little more sticky, and I will have to grind him up before I break him down. And this gave uh, Kingston like a just a contact high, I guess, from being around Riddle and needed milk and cookies. Yeah, I don't know if like in the you know over those two um, tapings over the course of like one day, Vince just thought. Man, this character is just not edgy enough. We've got to change things up for the last go home show, okay? Hit him with the weed references. Um, not nothing more God. edgy in 2021 than Dude. marijuana. Yeah, this shit was like maybe it was edgy in like 1997. Now, when you're talking about like, um, I don't know, like this shit being legalized, like every corner in Toronto is a, is a dispensary. Um, I just, I don't even understand, you know, trying to dance around the, the subject. It just makes you look old, you know, it makes you look, um, like it's a total generational like, gap. Like you're trying uh, th- really this, hard this tone of, of, um, promo completely written by, uh, it's a, a total shift from, it was just rolling my eyes at this. Xavier Woods and AJ Styles, uh, went all of a minute 20, uh, Kingston threw the microphone at Omos, who no-sold it. AJ had Woods in the calf crusher and went to deal with Kingston, so he broke the submission, turned around, and was caught with an inside cradle, and Woods wins. Done. Yeah, just just um, just getting us. like It just felt like a commercial for the match, I guess. You know? <laughs> what a commercial. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, there was a lot on this show where it was like, okay, we've... We're at the finish line. They have no ideas, dude. They're just like, what can we put into these three hours? Bad Bunny and Damian Priest pulled up in Bad Bunny's three. This was amazing. Uh, He pulled up and it was a $3 million Bugatti. And within 10 minutes, it was a $3.6 million Bugatti. So it increased in value inside the Thunderdome. That's that's really incredible because usually you drive it off the lot and it immediately depreciates, but this Bugatti went up in value in a segment, in a quarter. Wow, impressive. Wow. Braun Strowman comes out for a promo inside of the cage. He has been bullied by people all of his life, from people like Shane. He points out to us, for those that were deceived last week, the report card that Shane displayed, it was fake. He doesn't know what he's he's gotten himself into, that being Shane, but the running ends inside the cage. I'm going to whip your ass for everyone on this planet that has been called stupid. Which is taking ownership of a lot of deplorable people out there, too. I guess so. Like the um, people, like the nut, like the the anti vaxxers the people that don't wear masks, the crazy nuts. Like that's bronze fighting for a lot of questionable people. Well, I guess so. Yeah, um, hard hard to distinguish who you're defending here, but I found this to be a really interesting direction for a storyline. I mean, we are now treating Braun Strowman, one of the <laughs> the largest man in the company. As some sort of like downtrodden, you know, victim, um, because I guess he's been called stupid. And this was never really a character trait of bronze, nor do I really think it should be a character trait of bronze. Somebody who I think, you know, they've been trying really hard to m- look to to make look menacing and, and scary. We are basically admitting that, yeah, he is pretty dumb. Uh, and he, he's so dumb that he's going to defend all the people that have, are also dumb. Um, so <laughs> all I the question, dumb people are going to unite behind Braun. I definitely question the storyline. Yeah, the promo itself felt like you know a very generic '80s wrestler type of promo, uh, which showed that he is a- very angry. Which also shows that Shane, Shane's teasing has absolutely worked here. So we still don't really know the reason for Shane's confidence and what his, the source of his wit will be. But it's um you know it's difficult to to see any outcome here besides the introduction of of a new character who Shane must be positive will be able to outwit and dominate Braun. He said instead of here comes the money, Shane's going to hear 
here comes the body bag. So he's out to kill Shane. Shane comes out and says the decision to have a cage match is not bad. But on s- when is this one? Saturday or Sunday? I don't know. Okay. He's going to outwit Braun and beat him. And the next morning, Braun's going to look into the mirror and say, boy, I really am stupid. <laughs> I thought Shane was fine here. Sure. Yeah. He's great. Do you really want like do you want to see, like do you want to see this match? Seriously? Like they could like I I must have like, you know, really just like not cared enough in previous weeks, but I think maybe being separated by by a week now it's like me coming to the realization that they are building Shane McMahon versus Braun Strowman. Uh and I think that alone is like there's so many ways you can go about it. Here's the giant against the guy who dives off of things at WrestleMania. They're not emphasizing any of these facts. Instead, they're emphasizing this as some sort of story between a really smart guy and a guy who is supposed to be really dumb. Um, I just can't think of any way to like make me care less about, or at least like look at this match with any less importance. You know? No, I'm not and, looking and any, forward any to less this. Appeal. This is going to live and die based on whether you deliver some spectacular stunt, which to me, again, I, I think the cage match idea was... Um, a confusing one to, to go with that you're either going to just once again emphasize why the cage means nothing or you're going to completely handicap whatever you could get out of these two by placing them in a cage for 12 minutes, which is oh, going to be any, brutal. If anything, the cage lets you think that there won't be any sort of – I guess the stunt will be something – Well, that's what I'm saying. It's like either, either way they do I, – I, and I don't think that's a big deal anymore. It's like not. Shane going off of a regular cage, that's – commonplace you know what i thought actually over the last week i'm trying to think like is there a shane mcmahon match that would genuinely be of interest and i thought of if if they ever signed this person like at some point they just finally wwe signed this person and you could make any match and the person i came to was the match i would first want to see is shane mcmahon if the WWE brought in Nick Gage. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that, that match happen. would have such a like great appeal to it <laughs> that you could do a total Shane McMahon style match and it would make, and it would be the perfect Nick Gage match as well. And you well, let him do some promos and Shane plays this asshole character. I actually no. think that would, I, I I don't disagree with you, but I would be so sad to have to see Nick Gage sell for this fucking goop, the green Nickelodeon goop. Uh, can you? No, 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 no. I'm, can not, you imagine- I'm not talking about taking any of those ideas. That, I'm, that's what's I'm good. saying that, this, that's what this would character, happen, not these angles. No, that's what would happen, John. We would see Nick Gage, uh, Nick Gage's report card uh, photoshopped from, from weeks on. Um, it would just be terrible, dude. Okay, I, I take I, it we, back. <laughs> You've already deterred me from this. Yeah. But the match itself, the day of the match, I feel you of all people, I think you would be totally into that. Of course I would be. Oh, I think yeah. a lot of people would, to be honest. I think the actual match itself, because you would know Shane would kill himself and Nick Gage would be happy to kill him. If, if I, I think McMahon, it would have a weird dynamic that would somehow work. If we're going to fantasy book and say, like, okay, in some alternate reality, Shane is on the outs with Vince. He is cast cast away from the WWE. And somehow he decides, I'm going to make a comeback. I'm going to go through the indies. <laughs> and, like, Shane McMahon begins, like, an independent wrestling career. Like, like what David Arquette did. But, like, you know, like, it's Shane McMahon. And somehow he ends up in a GCW match with Nick Gage. That would be fucking awesome. It would be great. I have no doubt like that would probably turn out spectacular in some f- form or fashion. But in the WWE and the confines and the storytelling of the WWE, there is no way Nick Gage would look cool. No way. <laughs> he would be like, th- think of how they're treating Matt Riddle, okay? Like, think it, it would be that level of caricature, but for whatever they think Nick Gage is. <laughs> it, it, it would be something... <laughs> It would be definitely. He something. would be nails, dude. He would come out like in an orange <laughs> jumpsuit, like he'd be oh the new God. nails. Well, let's move on. <laughs> we had a handicap match with Braun against Elias and Jackson Riker. They attacked him. 
Braun fought back. He power slammed both. He uh, pinned both together. Two minutes and 38 seconds. Yeah. Yeah, I think Shane's winning this match on Sunday. I think he's got to have some, uh, whether he's going to debut someone. I think this could be who uh, it was one of our listeners that brought it up. The return of Daba Kato. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, whoever you th- whoever it is, I think it would have to be somebody who is as big, if not larger, than Braun. Otherwise, like, how would Shane be at all justified for for his confidence? Yeah, he's got to have somebody. Yeah, so I, th- I I could see that being the angle, and then you've got Braun and Dava Kato to look forward to this spring. That's right. The Miz and John Morrison are in the back carrying cans of paint, which. I guess we're recycling uh, the Braun Shane angle here. Um, this is red paint. They explain that they are artists and they have a masterpiece to paint as they walk up to the Bugatti. And Morrison notes its value and they just paint red all over this Bugatti. They write, hey, hey, hop, hop. Miz does finger painting all over it. And they drew bunnies, actually. All yeah. Right. Yeah. So so what is the value of this Bugatti now? Ooh, it it definitely plummeted. Probably. But they didn't destroy this. I mean, they didn't do the uh the cement mixer with McMahon's Corvette. They didn't go to that length. Well, still time. Still Friday. There's still the match itself. Well, after the break, Bad Bunny is fuming as he walks up to his Bugatti and he gets jumped by the Miz and Morrison. <laughs> Miz had the greatest line of this entire angle. He said, I don't respect your car, and I don't respect you. <laughs> and then Damian Priest appeared. He was way late here to the to this uh, to make the save. Rhea Ripley. Says, I, I have I have an under I have a suspicion about Damian Priest. I think he knew exactly what he was doing here. Oh. That would be what that he's secretly okay, so- working? With well, Miz listen, and Morrison? Listen, this whole thing was supposed to be a one-on-one match between Bad Bunny and Miz. Yep. And it's like, Bad Bunny get, gets attacked, nobody there to save him, and Priest is just like, oh no, friend, you're hurt? We gotta, you need me there. We, You can't handle this yourself. We gotta turn this into a tag team match. And that's what he did. Went out there and turned this into a tag match. Make, earned himself a payday here, Damian Priest. Maybe the man is working. Uh, he was politicking his way throughout this this episode. He's using him. Absolutely. Ripley says that her and Asuka have to coexist or else they will be ripped apart. I hated this tag match, but that's still to come. Uh, Lana and Naomi. Uh, th- th- we get the announcement of the tag team turmoil match. With Lana and Naomi, Dana Brooke and Mandy Rose, Ruby Riot and Liv Morgan, and Tamina and Natalia. And then uh, the graphic on the website also includes Billy Kay and Carmella. So it looks like we're going to have a five team uh, turmoil match. They might have jumped the gun on the uh, Carmella Billy Kay review. I think they did because they did not make that clear on the show. They, they just said that. Uh, Carmella was reviewing her resume and we never got an answer, but on the website, they put the graphic up there with all five teams. Okay. All right. To me, it's the most obvious like pop you do is that Carmella gets laid out and Billy Kay is all on her own and Peyton Royce joins her. I would love that. I think a certain Paul from New Jersey would, would that he would, he would go crazy. He would, uh, but, um, I don't like, let's just admit happen. the Billy Kay character had some fun segments. It's run its course. Peyton Royce has not done anything since this breakup. The two are better off together than they are apart. And why don't we just acknowledge that? This is a poor idea to break this this team up. It's like what the Dudleys did, right? Bailed on the singles careers and reunited them. I totally agree with you. Um, something tells me that won't happen, unfortunately. Well, we had the non-title match between Nia Jax and Shayna Baszler against Asuka and Rhea Ripley. Ripley tags in with Baszler. These two were the only two that can say that they beat AEW on December 18th of 2019 for the show built around Ripley beating Baszler for the Women's Championship. That was the only night they beat them in the demo and in viewers. Okay, wow. And here we are now. 
Ripley grabbed Reginald on the apron, and then Baszler attacks Ripley's knee. And this goes through the commercial break. We come back. They're beating down on Ripley's knee just forever. Finally, Asuka tags in, and then Ripley shoves Asuka off the turnbuckle, dumps her face first on the floor, and throws her into the ring. Baszler, knee strike, pins Asuka in 12 minutes and 2 seconds, as Byron sums up this entire thing. So much for trying to coexist. Now, if we were going to have Ripley at the end of this whole thing, she should have, like, she clearly comes out of this as, like, the heel in this equation with Asuka. To me, this would have made a lot more sense if Asuka, like, agrees to this match because she is a fighting champion and she'll enter this match. But it's all a plot from Rhea Ripley, that it would be Asuka selling the entire match weakened. She's the one that has her knee weakened. And then when Ripley finally enters the match, it's all a ploy just to beat up this wounded champion that she lured into this match. Instead, we did this all backwards, where Ripley is the one selling for 85% of this match, and then she turns on Asuka at the end. Yeah. Like, why? You're the one who made this match, and now you've, like, had your knee destroyed for the whole match. Like, you didn't look too too sharp in this whole idea. And this could have made sense, like, very easily. Ripley names the match, Asuka goes along with it, and then it's Asuka that gets hurt in the match. And it's just a plot by Ripley. Oh, maybe Ripley had a change of heart mid-match. Yeah. You know? Yeah. There could have been a point to this. I, I don't think they're putting that much thought into any of this. I think they just want, you know, attractive looking TV matches. Um, and this is what you got. But you're absolutely right, John. Could have been better. MVP met with Cedric Alexander. He grabs MVP by the jacket. And Shelton is next to him. And says that MVP's greed will cost him. Calls MVP a parasite. And a crippled has-been. What, what endearing baby faces. <laughs> just <laughs> making fun of this man for having a, an injury. Alexander then admits, I might not beat Lashley tonight, but I'm going to leave him with a scar to remember him by. So at least at least he realizes he's in way over his head tonight. I, w- I wouldn't say they're, you know, baby faces at all. And and that has me somewhat concerned because they're we know they're he- they're still heels, but they're not the best heels. They're the, te- the, the <laughs> touch of heels that like the real and heels beaten by the up. real heels. Yeah. Yeah. So that that means, you know, coming out of this, they're really just in a bit of a no man's land. So I'm I'm definitely concerned about their future. So they take off and then Lashley shows up and he just tells MVP what happened. And he says he's going to break Cedric's ass in half. Has anyone ever achieved that? I mean, look at the actual structure of it. I mean... Kind of in half, isn't it? To yeah. How do, you, how do you break that? That's like the starting half. position. So I don't know. Maybe he was going to do more. <laughs> he should have mean it. he want he wants to break his ass into thirds, <laughs> quarters. You know, uh, these these are the go home promos that you save for WrestleMania, <laughs> and they really whiffed on tonight. Uh, <laughs> did you catch what they're billing the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal as? Because they use this, like, the WWE line to promote it multiple times on this show. I must have missed it. Please enlighten me. The extraordinary tradition continues. Not even the tradition okay. that goes all the way back to the, the uh, years of 2014. No, it is the extraordinary tradition. Extraordinary. Like, the, was that an adjective they used to describe Andre? Uh, is that no. why? No. I mean, yeah, so okay. extraordinary. This didn't even make the, the the show. It's on. It's on TV Friday, and it will have the Fatal Four Way on top of it. So that's what's promoted for Friday. And I'm guessing that they must have just used um, stock fan footage for the Thunderdome. Because we didn't get any spoilers that came out for these shows. Yeah, they've done this for tape shows. Yeah. So, mm. Jackson Baszler interviewed by Schreiber. They are confident. <laughs> Sarah Schreiber's question is, are you confident you can defend your titles on Sunday? To Nia Jax's credit, she said, that's the dumbest question you have ever asked. It was a pretty dumb question. And I was waiting for Braun Strowman to come out and challenge Nia Jax for calling her dumb. 
Dumb questions get dumb responses. Lana and Naomi walk in. Dana Brooke and Mandy Rose appear. Tamina and Natalia on their day off showed up on Raw for this. And then the Riot Squad pop in. And then Billy Kay sneaks in and says that Carmella is reviewing her resume. Naya has no time for this. And these nine people argued. It was just, again, just a really generic segment to remind you that this match was happening and these are the people in it. This was um, the announcement of the match. This was our confirmation. Yeah. Yeah, there's no story, really. Bobby Lashley, Cedric Alexander, non-title, MVPs on commentary. Uh, Benjamin is at ringside. And at first, Benjamin and Alexander double-team Lashley. <laughs> they they ask MVP, are you concerned He's getting beaten down. MVP says, I'm not worried. Hey, Bobby, get angry. And with that, Bobby got angry, and he just destroyed these two. He had no problems overcoming this numbers disadvantage. Dude, Benjamin and Alexander, they are in trouble. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, this is their role leading up to WrestleMania. But, man, following Mania, I you know, what do, you, what do we see for them? I mean, at best, maybe a tag team uh, um and in that division, it's like, it's pretty meaningless. So, well, we'll see. Alexander mustered a comeback, which consisted of a missile dropkick. Lashley then dumped him, Stormbreaker, or at least his version of it. Not as pretty. And Benjamin then, from the floor, yells, Stop! But Lashley does not stop during the pro wrestling match. And he hits him with a spine buster. And then he applies the hurt lock. And Alexander submits in 1023. He went too far away. He used a full Nelson. That's against the code. <laughs> stop. <Yeah>. Please stop. <laughs> and then he laid out Benjamin with a flatliner, which is a perfect metaphor for these two and their post-mania run. Yeah. They're just left for dead, which, I mean, that was their role. Make Lashley mm -hmm. look strong going into mania, but that was it. Bad Bunny and Damian Priest come out. Priest reminds us that Bad Bunny is a Grammy Award winner, while Miz and Morrison are yesterday's news. Miz is worried, and uh, Miz was so worried about Bad Bunny that he couldn't even keep his title for longer than a week. So Damian Priest suggests we make this a tag match at WrestleMania. And Bad Bunny then takes over. He says, I just came here to follow my dreams because I love this business. I love and respect all the performers. I had so many great memories growing up, watching Raw and SmackDown, but I'm not sure what to think after this experience. I wrote that song for Booker T because I love and respect him, just like I respect Triple H, Steve Austin, Ric Flair, The Undertaker. I even used to love and respect The Miz, <laughs> but he doesn't respect me because I'm not a pro wrestler. But I am a man, and the Miz will respect me. You broke my DJ set. You disrespected my DJ, who's like a brother to me. He finished speaking in Spanish and said, After all this, after, after this man destroyed his Bugatti, he said, I do respect the Miz. But he crossed the line, and I will show him how to respect me. You are going to shut your... I'm going to shut your mouth and whip your ass. Do you know where we're from? And that's how it ended. Do you know where we're from? Man, I, lo I love that promo way more when you're recapping it than when Bad Bunny... I Listen, for, for a guy that's never cut a promo in his life, I, I thought this was very good. I, I can't say I, I really agree. Um... It was fine. Like, he didn't stumble uh, too badly upon his words or anything like that. But, God, I just... Dude, felt... this had more th This had more um, emotion than, I would say, 90% of WWE promos, which I know is not a high bar, but this was... For a guy that's literally never cut a promo, I thought this was more than passable. I just felt the story was... Just, is it, It's really inconsistent. because uh, There's a lot of this promo that was like... You know, I respect you, Miz. Uh, I respect such and such. Uh, even though I, yes, I know I did this. Yes, I know I, I made fun of you. Yes, I know I did this, but I respect you. Like, it was a lot of backpedaling from Bad Bunny. And at no point did I really feel sympathetic. Like, he was the one who was getting picked on in any of this stuff. I felt like he had he had all this shit coming to him. 
You know, like he he's been as much of a dick to the Miz as the Miz has been to him. I mean, the Miz did destroy his DJ set, and we didn't know how close Bad Bunny is to his DJ. So, yeah, I mean, but that he jumped to- on the he jumped off the top rope. They were even. Okay, um, I'm sure he did a bunch of other shit that I I can't remember right now. Well, what this promo sounded like was. It was almost like, man, we are so worried that this 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 outsider is going to get booed. So we have to show that he has so much respect for this industry, including going to the part of saying, I respect The Miz. And I, I do not sense that this crowd is going to be negative towards Bad Bunny when he comes out. Yeah, I don't know. Not sure. Who knows? I don't do think you like the tag right. match? Do, do, were you preferring to see what, what a singles match would look like between these two? I mean, even the singles match probably would have uh, uh, had a lot of Damien Priest in it. So I think it's probably the same. Miz and Morrison are on the screen. They said the Bad Bunny doesn't belong here. They accept the tag match and they take off in a limo. That's it. Sheamus spoke with Ali. He's going to be out on commentary. He says that we both hate Riddle. Who doesn't? And then Riddle scoots by right in between them on his scooter. Mm -hmm. Riddle and Ali with Sheamus on commentary. Riddle used a triangle early, then went for a Kimura. Uh, They went through a commercial break after Riddle went up to the desk and put on Sheamus' hat. And then Ali came from behind and hit him with a side Russian leg sweep. Afterward, Ali rolls through... uh, there's a Broton. He's caught with the Koji clutch, which Ali is calling lights out. And then from there, we had a swinging DDT by Ali blocked by Riddle into the bro Derek. And he pins him in 1034 and just sh- shouted back and forth with Sheamus. Match was pretty good. Some cool counters, impressive finish. So if you um, like good wrestling, you know, this was probably... Um, the brief glimmer you've had in these three hours. Yeah, there was not a whole lot to write home about wrestling wise on this show. I guess this would be the best thing you got tonight. Kevin Patrick interviewed Drew. Do you feel threatened by Corbin? Drew was very kind in his response. He says, I could say bad things about Corbin, but he is a big guy and he's dangerous. So sit back. Lashley was interviewed. (laughs) He was asked if he had a preference on who he faces on Saturday. He just cuts a promo as if he's facing Drew McIntyre on Saturday. This guy knows the score. He knows that King Corbin ain't doing shit to this guy. And then at 10.30 p.m., Drew McIntyre walks out. And I'm thinking, okay, we're getting 10 minutes of these two. And then we're getting a god-awful fiend Randy Orton segment to end the go home raw. No, I was wrong. We were spared the Orton fiend segment. They had no presence on this show. And instead we got 18 minutes of drew McIntyre and King Corbin. This thing was so goddamn slow. Drew sold for a long time. He hit him with a Glasgow kiss future shock. And then he stared up at the WrestleMania sign for help for power But then he's hit with a superplex, a deep six. MVP gets up and he's yelling at Corbin. We don't even know what the hell he's supposed to be doing here. Like if he pins him, is Drew out of the match? Well, then MVP clarified. It's not about beating him. It's about taking him out as he passes him a cane. Which at that point, if that's what it takes to get it into WrestleMania, wouldn't you just like bring a weapon? Wouldn't you? Like we've we've introduced murder as a storyline device. So if you really want to get into this match, you're thinking the deep fucking six is going to get you to take this guy out. The deep six, that's your strategy. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know what the deal was here. You know, if like, what, what was he? Um, what? So if he maimed, I'm going to beat Drew? you in a pro wrestling match so bad. That you're you won't be able to come back on Saturday. That's mm. the story. Right. And then he misses with the cane and is hit with the claymore. Eighteen minutes. Drew wins. Lashley walks out, and that's the end. Yeah, you know it was a 
very, you know, there's really nothing on this show that really moved any of the stories along. Um, it was just sort of a way to remind you what the matches were on Sunday, which you can achieve just as easily by going to Wikipedia and looking at the card. Um, it really just felt like a way to fill the three hours. Yeah, I would say that this, um, I would say this is a show that um, I like the Drew promo. I thought Bad Bunny was fine. No, I and didn't like anything on this show. Nothing. Okay. Well, um, then you didn't have much to uh, take away from this three hours. You're either sold on WrestleMania or uh, you're not. I'm just looking at the website, actually, and now the Tag Team Turmoil graphic appears to have disappeared. Oh, okay. So there well, you go. I wonder what's going to happen. I wonder why. I, d- I don't know. Uh, we will find out. Do Billy Kay and Carmella make it in there? All right. Well, that was Raw. Um, let's go to the forum. This show gets a 3 out of 10. <laughs> Solid. That's 30%. Well, Benjamin starts us off. Uh, all right. I can't do a Vince McMahon impression. Uh, this show had all the charm of Kid Rock. Okay. Jesus Christ. Uh, I don't think there's anything more inauthentic and disingenuous than a Braun Strowman promo claiming he was bullied his entire life by a geek half his size. At times, it's hard to watch Raw without wondering if they are deliberately tone deaf. Like the WWE Creative Brain Trust is some subversive Kaufman-like genius dealing in pure self-parody. I know how far-fetched that is and always comes back to my senses. After all, this is a show with Matt Riddle barfing out several weed references and getting a big pyro ejaculation for kicking his slippers off. This show is icky, and I feel grade 5 level D- minus report cards stupid after watching it. We go to Eric Marcotte. I get that right? Shit. Marcotte. It's okay. Eric Marcotte. He says, he says, I watched Raw for the first time in a few years today. Oh, I've dear. never watched one live since they went to three hours. <laughs> I'm having trouble finding the words to describe how much I hated this show. No one on the show is likable in the slightest. All the matches were nothing. And none of the WrestleMania matches are hotter now than they were before the show. I watched the same Scott Stanford ad like 12 times. I've been broken. T- zero out of 10. Boy. Alexander from Portland, perhaps the worst WrestleMania go home show I've seen. AJ was one. AJ Styles was one of the most protected men on Raw, yet he's losing weekly to build a tag team title match. Guys like Braun Strowman, Riddle, Lashley, and Drew McIntyre were made to look strong by beating participants from the Andre Battle Royal. What baffled me most was the women's representation on the show. Oscar looked foolish being turned on in a tag match, where she, which she never agreed to. But why would WWE book their champion to get pinned on the go home show? The women's gauntlet teams looked like utter dorks waiting their turn to argue in a backstage segment. Yet one of those teams is having two WrestleMania matches this weekend. My silver lining: next week's show is the Raw after Mania, and I can't see it being worse than tonight. Two out of ten. What kind of crowd reaction do you think Riddle will get at WrestleMania? I don't know if the popularity of the Bro Chant can overcome how irritating the character has been. Uh, what kind of crowd do I? I mean, I think they'll they'll treat treat him fine. You know, they'll treat him like a baby face. Um, will they love him? Maybe. Fuck, I don't know, dude. It's um, I don't know what people like anymore. It's hard to tell. I don't think uh, anyone knows for for I, um for this. I haven't weekend, seen but... a I haven't seen a crowd in like a year, so I have no idea how they'll react. I think they'll react the way that the the audience want. The, the riddle wants riddle it. has never been in front of a crowd on the main roster. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Well, we go to Kate finally, who says, My excitement level for Mania is l- nearly unchanged from watching this show, except that I'm glad the Miz Bunny match got switched to a tag team. Sadly, the go home show didn't feel in any way special, just like a regular version of Raw with the same stories lumbering along. I'm tempted to say that the problem is that the show is too long, but it occurred to me tonight that this wouldn't be as much of a problem if they used more of their roster, do more frequent call ups from NXT if necessary, and had longer, more developed matches. Right now, the wrestling seems to be a quick feature between segments of a sketch comedy show and not a well-written one. And for the love of God, stop letting Vince and his team write for Riddle. We get it. No one on the writing team has ever smoked pot in their life. Maybe it's time they did because it's not like it would make the script portions worse. Yeah, Raw is in a state. Um, That's the best I can say. I thought this was a... um, Man, this is a go-home Raw. Like, this used to be their best show 
of the year. Last year's was, I thought, very good. And it was just, you know, it was some great promos. And when I heard that Drew one, I was like, man, maybe maybe we're going to get some solid promos tonight. But it was, I just thought, man, that 20 minutes at the end just was squeezing any interest out of me. And I mean, there was, this was not a show that to me amplified your interest. Like they did the big angle, I guess, with the Bugatti. That was like your, your angle on the show. Um, but that was the big angle. What other, what was bigger like, on the show angle wise? Finger like, that painting, was finger painting on a f- car. Like, man, we used to have people like get run over, you know, maybe I, I'd at least prefer that. Brett getting run over. Then, like, you know, finger mm, that, that That wasn't good either. That wasn't good either. No, it wasn't. No. But at least it was like, man, give you yeah, some sort of like, at least, you know, they spent money some for, you know, have maybe hired a stuntman for it or something. This was like, yeah, I, I, I thought this whole show was just, uh, just a way for them to get through last week. Do you think this was um waterproof paint? Do, do you think it came off easily? Guarantee you it has. Are you kidding maybe me? Maybe it was ketchup. Yeah. They're not wasting money on on a skit like this. Well, this this would be that would have been a really expensive angle um, if they yeah, gone to that it? length. Yeah, that's that angle is about the cost of one of these shows. How much money do they make per one of these rows? Uh, well, do do the math of a uh, two hundred sixty five million divided by fifty two. I'm not doing. They're that. definitely making enough that they could they they can definitely afford a Bugatti every week. They could, but I don't think they would. Well, oh, that God. was raw. Uh, night one. Wait till we get to night eight. Night nine. I think it, it's uphill from here. Okay, I think SmackDown might be pretty. SmackDown is going to be just as shitty as this. I can tell. I don't think but, SmackDown is going to be all that bad, to be honest. I think that te- that Fatal Four Way, I think, will be very good, and that's going to be right. better than anything tonight. Okay, you're probably right. And then the Battle Royal will be just, you know, at least some, That'll be some, nothing. some eventfulness will come out of that. But, like, you know, tomorrow is the Hall of Fame. There's Prime Target, I guess. Those, Impact those should too, be... if you're keeping up with that. Uh, Impact, and take, Impact's Thursday. Oh, it's Thursday this week. You're right. They move. They move. But, but, man, the takeovers the next two nights with AEW, that's, those are going to be they excellent look killer. nights. Those are going to be excellent nights for pro wrestling. Uh, Friday, SmackDown, yeah, whatever. I'm sure it'll be fine. Saturday, Sunday, I think, you know, all this said, like, this show sucked. It was terrible. But I think we'll see everybody's best effort at WrestleMania. Dude, these lineups look more than, like, I think the shows are going to be very good. They're both listed for um, 8 till 11, which they could always go past that. But it's interesting to see they are slotted in. And we got seven matches each night. Like, they, like, three, three and a half hours is all they're going to need. And when you look at some of these matches, like, when... You get the creative out of the way, and it's just they go out there and work. Like I, I'm not worried about either of the mania cards being, you know, satisfactory wrestling shows, if not very good. Like there's a lot here that has the potential to be very strong on both nights. Yeah, totally agree. So, uh, yeah, we wait all that, and then we're back here uh, next Monday. But John and I are going to actually preview the entire card in a special podcast that we'll be releasing tomorrow evening. And we aren't going to do it alone, John. No, no, we will be we will be joined by guests. So tune in, and we will be previewing both nights of WrestleMania. Very exciting! So tune in, everybody. That'll be released on the free feed, and uh, everything else that's coming out this week. Subscribe to everything that we've got going on: our YouTube channel, our regular channel, our Patreon, the Up Next Twitch, all this stuff. Oh, I'm bit just. Non-stop. Postwrestling.com, where you get it all. That is where you can go check it out. Uh, thank you to everyone for joining us. Uh, again, if you want to check out the entire video from Post Podcast Day, it's up for cafe members. And store.postwrestling.com, the limited edition Post Podcast Day shirt available, designed by friend of the show, Robert Pearson, comes in black or uh, gray. You have your, your choice you can make. You could get both. You could, yeah, if you really wanted to. You don't have to. You could get, uh, you know, one for, you know, night one and the other for night two of WrestleMania. You could alternate. If you're crazy like that, yeah, go nuts. That's it. Wei Ting has had enough of tonight's go-home edition of Raw, uh, and he is politely asking all of us to please 
Go home. Good night.